Um, my subject is actually how I treat myelofibrosis, so try to bring together some of those ideas. But certainly, um, Stefan, you made me think about some different ways I might treat or think about managing some of my patients. So, um, and I would also like to start with um, a clinical case and uh, to think back to Hans's talk. So, um, the first thing I think about when I'm managing my patients, even if they're patients that have been sent to me for a, an opinion, and as this patient was, please see this lady, she's Jack 2 v 617 f positive, she has splenomegaly, pancytopenia, this was about five years ago, you're doing some fancy trials with Jack inhibitor drugs, is this patient suitable for a clinical trial? So um, we requested the bone marrow biopsy for review, and um, clearly, this patient did not have a diagnosis of myelofibrosis. This patient actually had a diagnosis of Gaucher's disease. And in fact, the JAK2V617F molecular test was a false positive. So um, this is probably the first and last time I will ever make a diagnosis of Gaucher's disease, but this patient is doing very nicely on replacement therapy with no bone pain, splenomegaly is better, and her cytopenias are also improving. Um, in the UK, we actually do a multidisciplinary, almost like a committee meeting, to integrate all of the important features. And the pathologist is there to lead the discussion uh, with the clinician, and often in cases where there are complex features, such as complex karyotypic abnormalities, um, the scientists who perform those tests will also be there. So in, and then we record a, a multidisciplinary diagnosis and we also make a treatment plan. In our centre, we're lucky enough to be able to link in with the team at King's, so it can help us sometimes when there are difficult features, as there often are, in advanced myelofibrosis, where the question is, does this patient really have MDS? Does this patient have CMML? And I really appreciate the comments of Hans with regard to being very, very cautious with your patients who are lacking uh, any of the typical driver mutations. Take a really careful look at those patients. And then once we've made a diagnosis, um, just a more general point with regard to all MPN, but of course this holds for myelofibrosis as well, um, these patients do get thrombosis, so I would consider prophylaxis with low-dose aspirin, although clearly the evidence for this as a panacea is lacking in myelofibrosis as it is in ET. Although we're thinking about spleen, quality of life, leukemia transformation, it's still really important to think about our patient in terms of their vascular risk. Of course, we have to assess prognosis, and we need to be thinking about comorbidities and the impact of those. And I think um, also a word to disease education. We had, have had quite some discussion in this field about are these blood cancers or aren't they blood cancers? And certainly, I think we have no doubt that myelofibrosis is a blood cancer. But I would also tell my patients with ET and PV they have a blood cancer. And increasingly, I find that patient advocacy um, patients have often Googled information anyway, but I find it useful to put them in touch with patient advocacy groups. In terms of myelofibrosis, the therapeutic landscape as it stands is more complicated now than it was in the past. But I would sort of take you through this algorithm in terms of having made a diagnosis looked at the patient as a whole, thought about their comorbidities, done some disease education, and then I'm going to calculate a prognostic score, and I'm going to assess the patient's symptoms and think about um, different treatments. I tend to use a formal symptom assessment, if possible, for my patients. So we happen to use a simple tear-off sheet, um, which is actually made available in the UK from Novartis, not all of our patients get on the internet and use the app, but I find it's a very simple visual tool and it's a helpful educational tool for patients. They can fill it in in the waiting room and some patients are really big fans of these. They bring sheets off them 
uh, to me when they come back. But it helps me, for example, in this patient to identify um, that fatigue and night sweats are a major problem uh, for the patient. And then I can follow that up um, in the future when I come to identify these particular symptoms and try treating them. Just to draw your attention to, if you're going to look at these individual scores, obviously they're very individual for a patient, but um, the group of Ruben Mesa presented at the EHA meeting last year from over 800 patients with myelofibrosis and international analysis that a single symptom score of five or a total symptom score of over 20 indicates a patient that really may well be struggling with their patients, with their symptoms, correlates well with the DIP score and might be somebody that you might want to think about addressing symptoms. You don't just have to turn to JAK inhibitor therapy, of course, but um, you need to be thinking about those treatments. And then we need to think about the patient's individual clinical need and what different aspects of disease are problematic for the patient. I'm not going to talk um, in great detail today about allogeneic stem cell transplantation because that's not really my field. My role is more about deciding when is a patient suitable to hand over to the transplant clinician and how should I best improve their performance status before they go for a transplant. And current guidelines would suggest that patients with a prognosis of less than five years may well be eligible. And I find the molecular markers useful in two ways around transplantation. If the patient is a high risk for transplant and has a poor donor and lacks one of the molecular markers, I think that's helpful for me sometimes in trying to make a decision maybe to avoid a very high risk transplant. On the other hand, if a patient is intermediate one or just intermediate two and has one of the molecular markers with a good a transplant donor and as a good risk for transplantation, that would encourage me to move towards transplant. I showed this treatment algorithm from Francesco Chavantes yesterday for the management of anemia. Anemia, in my mind, remains a big problem for the treatment of these patients, and I think it's helpful that we have the possibility of testing newer agents in that setting. But I tend to measure EPO levels, as we said yesterday, before initiating a JAK inhibitor. Use an ESA if the levels are low, or use Danazol or an equivalent drug for at least um, three to six months um, in patients who have either not responded to EPO or have high EPO levels. Um, concerning interferon alpha, usually in my practice we use pegylated interferon alpha 2A, but we are interested in the novel formulations of um, pegylated interferon. And usually we would use th these agents in low-risk patients with proliferative phase and without very large splenomegaly, i.e. less than 10 centimetres. And that's based on the work from the French group. Hydroxyurea is now very rarely used in my practice, except in low-risk patients who've got very proliferative disease and a prior history of thrombosis. We touched on um, yesterday ruxolitinib and we touched on the data from the study 251. You saw some data from that study again today and also the comfort trials. When I'm thinking about using a JAK inhibitor for my patient, I'm mindful of the major benefits that we saw, which are highlighted in this very simple slide of a, a lady that came to me and was treated in the JAK in, in the comfort 2 studies. This patient had a significant reduction after 72 weeks, well, much earlier, actually, in her spleen size. She had a significant improvement, as you can see from the quote on the bottom of the slide, in her quality of life. She gained weight. That's an important marker of patients who may well have the survival benefit. And she continues to do well on this drug. So these are the type of patients that I'm thinking of using ruxolitinib for, but I don't now wait until the spleen is so massive that it is into the pelvis for my patient. Um, we do know, of course, that there is a mixed effect of uh, JAK inhibitors on, on the JAK2 allele burden, but I don't measure this in my routine clinical practice. I don't even get an allele burden at the time of diagnosis, although Hans's talk made me think about that in trying to elucidate difficult patients. <laughs> 
And nor do I routinely follow up patients in terms of what's happening to their bone marrow biopsy. Here you can see the data from the COMFORT-2 study with the patients according to their last available bone marrow biopsy. And you can see a very mixed pattern with around 16% of patients having an improvement in their fibre score, but an equal percentage having worsening of fibrosis. This is not something we use, of course, to monitor JAK inhibitors in clinical practice. Do I tell my patients that they're likely to have a survival advantage f uh, when I start them or I'm talking to them about using ruxolitinib? Yes, I do, because I find the data from the comfort studies uh, very, very compelling. And here I've chosen to show you the data for overall survival from comfort two. Here you can see the clear separation of curves between standard therapies and ruxolitinib. And after all, this is what you're thinking about when you're seeing your patient in the clinic. Am I going to use ruxolitinib for this patient, or am I going to think about using um, an immunomodulator? Am I going to use hydroxyurea? And this is something that I have in my mind. Should I use ruxolitinib if this patient has splenomegaly and symptoms, has intermediate two risk disease or greater? I think this is compelling evidence that I should. And I do tell the patient they're likely to have a survival advantage from the treatment. How do I know that my patient's going to likely have a survival advantage and when do I think that I might need to stop the treatment or modify the dose? That's quite tricky, but I think there are some very helpful data. First of all, the patients who have a spleen response to ruxolitinib, at least in, at the first 24 weeks, are likely to have a survival advantage. There's a hint here that the greater the spleen response, the better the survival advantage. And so in my practice, I tend to try to achieve the best possible spleen reduction for my patient. This data is also um, true for the cohort of patients treated at the MD Anderson and, and assessed by Surge. This is a slide that I showed yesterday, showing correlation with palpable spleen length reduction. And after all, I don't do MRIs in routine clinical practice for my myelofibrosis patients. So here, a nice correlation with reduction in spleen length and overall survival. Also seen as we saw yesterday, but I wanted to show it again just to emphasize to you, Although the intermediate one-risk patients were not included in the comfort studies, these patients can also have a significant symptom burden and reduced uh, uh, life expectancy. And in my clinical practice, I certainly think about using ruxolitinib on the basis of the data from the JUMP study and the ROBUST study. And some of the other studies that have been done with uh, later JAK inhibitors have also included intermediate one-risk patients and also suggest a benefit for those patients. So I apologize as something's changed a little bit about the formatting of this slide, but this is just a very practical approach uh, from the British guidelines with regard to how we use ruxolitinib in clinical practice. I alluded to this yesterday when we were discussing in the symposium um, use of the drug. So in the UK, we regard ruxolitinib as a first-line therapy for splenomegaly and or symptoms. So you don't have to have both. Individualize the target for the patient. Screen the patient for infections before therapy. And adjust the dose to the maximum tolerated, treating for 24 weeks to assess whether your patient is going to benefit or not. There's a schematic that we use, a bit like a traffic light, for considering whether to continue or stop, thinking about spleen and symptom response and toxicity, and infections are really included there in terms of toxicity. If I have a patient who has an active acute bacterial infection, I very much stress that it's important not to stop or reduce the dose of ruxolitinib, but to continue with the same dose and treat the infection, and then review whether I think or not ruxolitinib contributed to that the risk of infection. If I am going to stop um, ruxolitinib, I will gradually taper and warn my patient about the return of spleen, uh, splenomegaly and symptoms. Concerning uh, management of on-target effects of ruxolitinib, just a slide about early onset cytopenias. These are to be expected and often, as we'll see on the next slide, resolve towards baseline after the first three months. So 
Um, generally, I don't taper or change the dose according to anemia. My plan for anemia management is usually to support the patient with transfusion. I might think about adding ESA or danosol or even thalidomide initially. The only time that I would really be thinking about reducing the dose would be in the setting of severe thrombocytopenia or neutropenia, which are, after all, much rarer for my patients. Um, here is the slide showing um, the dynamics of um, both the haemoglobin and the platelet count. This is from the comfort data. Here you can see the haemoglobin falling by, my rule of thumb is roughly 10 to 20% and then returning towards baseline and the platelet count here falling by around 30 to 40% and remaining static. So this is very important to bear this in mind when you're managing your patients in the first few months. And as we saw yesterday, the development of anemia on roxalitinib in the first 12 weeks, as shown here in this analysis from Comfort 2, does not correlate with um, poor survival. Whereas if you've got a patient who's becoming progressively anemic and it's not due to early treatment with roxalitinib, as you can see here, this orange Kaplan-Meier plot, these are the patients with the poorest survival. Later onset cytopenias are completely different um, from my perspective. Here we should have a suspicion of disease evolution and remember that the disease can evolve in a different way in a patient on the JAK inhibitor. You need to be looking at the patient's blood film for blasts, think about the bone marrow, exclude drug-drug interactions, remembering CYP3A4 um, uh, metabolism, and exclude cumulative toxicity. So beyond this standard management for my patients, what else do I think about? So I think that patients who've got an unresponsive anemia, if they're not happy just having regular transfusions and iron chelation, are difficult, and particularly patients with profound thrombocytopenia are particularly difficult. Assessing loss of response to JAK inhibitors, roxalitinib primarily, is also difficult. And here we have to think about other drugs, combination therapy, and uh, look to being a little bit innovative for our patients. There are other JAK inhibitors, but there are none of them that are available in routine practice. Um, we touched yesterday on, on those, and I'm going to leave them for now because we need to await further data with pacritinib and a decision for what's going to happen with momolotinib after the results of the Simplify 1 and 2. There are other potential treatment targets, including those very nicely outlined by Stefan earlier, that we could be thinking about and that we are assessing either in single-agent studies or in combination trials. And Patients who are failing roxalitinib, however that's defined, are probably good candidates for those trials. But I would also say that we should be thinking of testing those agents instead of roxalitinib, although ethically that's quite difficult, I think. What about combination therapies? Well, there are huge numbers of combination strategies that are and have been tested. But who should we test these strategies in and what should the endpoints be? Well, I think in standard clinical practice, we're really looking at improving tolerance. So we're using combinations with e ESA, with Danosol, with IMIDS, etc., to try to improve the haemoglobin or the platelet count for our patient. And the rest of these are really experimental. In clinical practice, I know Serge is going to talk about blast phase, but our own institutional practice is to try in patients who are not going to um, do well with induction chemotherapy, the combination of azacitidine with ruxolitinib is in a clinical trial. A word on ruxolitinib plus allogeneic stem cell transplantation. Obviously, this is a very attractive strategy before transplant, but there are also downsides to using this drug before transplant. It may worsen the need for transfusion and iron overload and infection, and there are ongoing studies um, including the Jack Allo study, which I think is a really interesting study that's ongoing in France, which will also allow us to assess benefits of having a donor and proceeding to a transplant versus patients who would otherwise go to a transplant but don't have a donor. So that might give us really interesting insights into the role of transplantation. And finally, I think it's really important to highlight the striking benefit of roxlitinib in uh, management of graft versus host disease, which is now in ongoing studies across the world, probably also in your countries. And this is my summary slide. Um, 
I'm sure these are aspects that you think about and you practice every day. But thinking about an accurate diagnosis is easier now, but it's still challenging. Try to use a standardised approach. Individualise your treatment targets. And we've had a discussion about management of anemia, etc., and a look to potential second-line options. So I want to uh, thank and acknowledge um, my team, the global community,